Welcome to A House Divided. I'm Daniel Weinberg, and we're sitting in the broadcast studio of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop here in Chicago. Uh, next time, we hope to have our author here in the studio with us, but meanwhile, we're over Zoom because of reasons you all know. Uh, I'm very happy to be hosting this particular event because this was a fabulous book that I just read by David Kent, he, who has had over 35 years experience in scientific research, consulting, and writing. He's the present president of the Lincoln Group of the District of Columbia. He's on the executive committee of the Abraham Lincoln Institute, and he's on the Lincoln Forum Board of Advisors. His writings appear in the Lincoln Herald, Civil War Times, the Smithsonian's Civil War Studies newsletter, and elsewhere. But today we're going to speak about his latest book, Lincoln and the Man Who Saved America. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, I switched over before I wanted to. He's the author of Lincoln and the Man Who Saved America, Abraham Lincoln and Nikolai Tulsa, uh, Connected by Fate, and Tulsa, the Wizard of Electricity. Also Edison, the inventor of the modern world, and an ebook on Tulsa, uh, Renewable Energy Ahead of Its Time. Now we'll get to today's book, which is about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln and the Fire of Genius. How Abraham Lincoln's commitment to science and technology helped modernize America. It's the Lions Press book, 321 pages, with an introduction by Sidney Blumenthal, and it's 29. 95. And we will be able to get you with it, a signed book plate. Uh, if you're watching this uh, after our live event, perhaps on C-SPAN or on YouTube, we have books still available with uh, a signed book plate that David produced for us. So David, with your introduction, with your background in science, what triggered your switch from being, from being a scientist to an historian, and in particular, Abraham Lincoln? Well, it, it, this, uh, it goes way back, actually. Um, I kind of had a dual career. You know, it was a paying career and a non-paying career. And uh, so I grew up in a town that was very steeped in history, it called itself the birthplace of American independence. But it was also a seacoast town with a lot of beaches and, and uh, and, and marshes, and Jacques Cousteau was really big when I was young. So, you know, I went in, I ended up in going into science as a career, as a paying career. So I did that for 30 plus years, but that whole time I was still into Abraham Lincoln um, uh, because of the history upbringing I had. Uh, although oddly enough, the history was mostly the revolutionary war time period. And I was always somewhat the outcast. So I was doing civil war in Lincoln. <laughs> Uh, so I always had these two things going in parallel. And, and then uh, about 10 years ago, I decided I'm just going to flip the switch and I'm going to do the focus on the Lincoln side of things and mm -hmm. put the science in the background, in part because of the idea for this book uh, that I started to realize that there's a lot of science and technology running through Lincoln's life. And I wanted to spend more time digging that out. And, uh, and that's what ended up uh, basically turning into this book after all this time. Well, it is the first in-depth study of Lincoln's interest in technology and science and how that impacted his life and also his presidency. Uh, as you demonstrate, David, Lincoln was a catalyst for some of that transformation wrought by science and technology. And it's an important book because of the important claims you make about Lincoln. Now, this is really a chicken or egg question, perhaps. Which came first? Did Lincoln forge a science and technolo technological path, or was that path already there and he helped to foster it? Or is it really a middle ground that he was always prepared for through his life? Uh, it was a kind of a middle ground. I mean, there, the 1800s, especially the middle 1800s, was very a uh, big time for the development of industrialization, 
uh, of technology and of science. Uh, early on, their science was done by men of science. You know, scientists didn't, that term didn't even get invented to the 1830s. So um, it became more formalized. It was more of a scientific method, not still not totally. And it was happening and technology was happening. You were getting switches, you got steam, steam power, which led to other transportation and manufacturing type things. So Lincoln, despite being on the, in the frontier, realized how important this was. And he started learning more and more about it and then pushing for it to be in, incorporated more in society. Um, and I think that probably the big thing about Lincoln's contribution, prior to where Lincoln was, um, science and technology was, especially science, was mostly done by wealthy landowning uh, Eastern people that had um, access to a very uh, classical education, uh, including languages and some science and math. Um, and had a lot of free time because they were wealthy. And in large, and in a lot of cases, like Thomas Jefferson had hundreds of enslaved people doing all the labor. And it was really something that benefited the wealthy class. Then you get to Lincoln, he starts realizing that this is something that, you know, I hate to use the term trickle down, but this is something that could benefit the working class as well. And of course, his background just fit right into that. You know, he, he grew up on the farm. He grew up in, the, in poor. He grew up with limited education. And he saw how science and technology could be a mechanism by which people at his level could grow, better their own condition. And then everybody, society, uh, basically government could create a system that would allow everyone an equal chance in the race of life. So he saw this benefiting the masses, not just the, the few. Well, he thought uh, education should be for mostly for practical usage. And, I, and that's, I, I guess, what you're saying with science <clears throat> and technology, that the masses should educate themselves as they should politically to have a, a viable democracy, but they also to benefit themselves. So that's a fair statement to say that's what he thought, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, I, no, go ahead. And, and do, you, do you think, though, that I mean, he had a great curiosity? That was throughout his life. Maybe you can say something about his, his innate curiosity. And would you then consider that innate curiosity in the realms of science and technology? Uh, is the, was he a Renaissance man in that regard? Yeah, Lincoln... Um, I think most people that, that are here probably know enough about Lincoln to know that he was innately curious, that he was somebody who, he didn't like farming, it was a bore, it was labor, but you know, it's like he just didn't like it. He wanted to be intellectually stimulated. Um, but he was on the same boat as everybody else, of all of his peers. They were growing up on the frontier, we're talking about. They're growing up on the frontier, there wasn't much education. Uh, you basically learn to read and write and cipher to the rule of three, you know, basic stuff. And that's what he later says that, well, he learned to read and write and cipher to the rule of three. And he was basically really not being straightforward with how much he actually knew. Um, but because of his innate curiosity, because of his desire to learn academically, he spent a lot of time studying on his own. So he, he says that he, he did less than a year of formal schooling. That was pretty standard for people where he was, his peers. Uh, they may not get very much schooling and you only did school in the winter in between the, the planting, uh, harvesting seasons. You know? So, but he would, he would always read books and he would borrow books. And then he would, he had a, and maybe I can talk about this a little bit more, but he, he had a way of running things over in his head over and over and over again to, to get them to get them there, to learn them. Instead of just learning, you know, reading it and studying for the test like I used to do in, in, in high school, you know, he, he would study these things. 
Um, and there was. Well, he, he said that he went to his corner in the log cabin and after listening to the adults, uh, he would think it over and over. And as it was said, bind it north, bind it south, bind it east, bind it mm -hmm. west. And he would then be able to kernelize it so that not only he could understand it, but then he could allow others to understand it when he told about it. Right. So he gathered, is this what he really did, I think, in science and technology, and as he did in everything, he gathered the facts as he could, he understood them, then made up his mind and a course of action, and mm -hmm. kind of kept to that afterward. Uh, you were talking about the age that he lived in. Would you compare the time of technological and scientific advancement, how would you compare that to the Industrial Revolution and the computer age that we're in, uh, the import of his time. Yeah, all see a lot of this stuff was going on um, uh, at the same time, and there was a lot of things happening. So Lincoln was aware that these things were happening. He was paying attention to. He was reading. He was reading histories. He was looking at what was happening in England, which was um, ahead of us when it came to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and then he was seeing how they could be implemented in the United States and how they could, could help. And he, he did this you know, all through his, his political career and his legal career, where he would observe and then put these things into practice uh, and, and try to get them to, uh, to help the greater number of people. Well, he, uh, you know, he, he, gave his, he gave an early lecture before the presidency, 50s on discoveries and inventions. We have, this was really, I think, the, the first book that just had his lecture in it. Uh, it was produced in 1915 by the great book dealer in San Francisco, John Howell. And it's really a wonderful short little read of his, his speech that he gave in Bloomington, Illinois. And then he delivered again in uh, Jacksonville, Peoria, Decatur, all in Illinois. And he extolled, for instance, the, the printing press, even though it, to me, it took out uh, the livelihood of numerous monks. And he also said that a new country was necessary for freedom of mind to develop. Mm -hmm. And that America was the, maybe the last best hope, not only for democracy, but for the freedom of the mind. So let's please, please give a quick, uh, explanation of his discoveries and inventions talk and what he was extolling at that time. Yeah, this, uh, like I said, this was uh, discoveries and inventions he gave several times, uh, mostly in 1859. So he's between uh, the Lincoln-Douglas debates and, and running for the presidency. And he's just looking at, well, I want to make some money on a lecture tour because it was becoming big and the, the Lyceum addresses were, were becoming big at the time. Um, and then continued to become even bigger. So he wanted to do and just do this lecture tour and try this whole thing out. And of course, because everybody else is doing something, he decides, well, what can I talk about? I'm going to talk about something that I both like and that I can use as almost a parable. And that's what the discoveries and inventions uh, came to be. And in fact, when you when you look at discoveries and inventions, and I go into, into the book, I actually go into the, it's very complicated because there's two pieces to it, which may or may not be separate uh, lectures. Um, there's probably a middle piece that's missing. And then there's a piece that there's probably a, re, a, re, a reading copy that he had that Robert Lincoln had after the fact and then lost. And uh, so, there, so it's, it's kind of complicated to understand it, but in general, he, he takes, the kind of thing uh, that people understood, which was the Bible. Most people didn't know anything about science, but they understood the Bible. So he uses that as a basis for how, to, how you can work through the, his growth in science and technology. So, I mean, the first discovery is Adam and Eve finding, uh, discovering the fig leaf apron after the fall. Well, fig leaf apron leads to clothing, which leads to uh, the idea that, you know, from, you could cut the skins off of animals and use that as clothing, but then you discover that you can get, use the fibers from animals like wool or the fibers from plants like cotton, and you can pull out the fibers and you can make textiles. You could, you could make uh, clothing. 
which leads to sewing, <laughs> which leads to, and then he goes on and on and he talks about other mechanization and the advent of steam, uh, steam power, and all of these different things related to technology. So this is one of the areas where he's, he's promoting the idea that people can grow, that people can progress. In fact, early in, the, in that lecture, he says, uh, man is not the only animal who labors, but he's the only, man, only animal that uh, improves on that labor. So that, and he's leading through it. He also talks about how that in that lecture about communication, uh, where you start with just kind of grunting noises and then you formulate language and then you can write that language down and then, and, and that so more people can see what's going on and you can express ideas further and then printing. And printing was the great equalizer. You could print this and, and send it along all for far distances uh, to multiple people. And, and they, a lot of people talk about you know, printing is basically the democratization of, 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 uh, of, of government and of, of populace. Um, so yeah, printing, and then you have, you know, all these other things that of course that led to telegraph and now you have, you know, tweets and, and everything right, else. Right, right. All of this was in there. And in the end, um, I have to mention because it's the title of my book and the very end of this lecture, which kind of ends abruptly, he talks about the problem with a lot of these inventions is that um, anybody could just copy it, slap their name on it and sell it. And the person who invented, invented it had no special advantage. So he talks about the patent system and under the patent system, um, you could add the, uh, uh, the fuel of interest for the fire of genius in the discovery and production of new and useful things. So that fuel of interest is financial interest. You're protected for a certain period of time and you can invent something and then make some money off of it before somebody steals it and, and just copies it. Um, well, you know, so that, that became, practical... that's what ended up being the title of the book, that fire of genius part of that. Well, he had a very practical reason for that because he is the only president to own a patent. Even Jefferson didn't do that. Here is an 1849 patent book. And on, as we know, on page 262 is uh, Lincoln's patent for uh, lifting a boat over a shoal, which he had a problem with at some point. And mm -hmm. here is the patent that he produced. And there's even a model in the Smithsonian uh, of <clears throat> this patent that he had. Um, mm -hmm. This is maybe getting ahead of ourselves because we're not to the Civil War period that I want to talk about, but there were over 30,000 patents during his administration. So it really was a huge effort to help those scientists, those inventors to monetize what they were getting for the patent. This is the ones in the Smithsonian. Right, and that that uh, that paragraph that you showed is uh, the short version. It's, it's just the summary, right. and then um, there's also the full patent with drawings of how this works. And Lincoln, that the drawings themselves were probably done by the patent attorney, but Lincoln helped build that model uh, that you showed. Um, he had another guy in 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 Springfield uh, building it, and he he did part of it, at least the pole parts and everything. But this was his idea, and to to look at this patent, he has to understand the science of buoyancy, which is in science it's called the Archimedes principle, uh, the idea that uh, of buoyancy that uh, you, there's a displacement, and he he you know he never took physics or anything like that, but he had studied so many of these different books that I talk about in the book, uh, most of which I obtained and was able to look through uh, in order to learn something about buoyancy and how it all works. Uh, um, so that's, and, and as you said, said later, the, in during the, the North was very much, in, uh, they had a lot of patents in the North, very few in the South, and that made a big difference during the Civil War. Well, uh, debt was certainly about 60% of his law cases as a, as a lawyer in the 40s and 50s. Uh, but what type of cases was he involved 
in related to technology and science? And did he have to read books to understand that technology and science for each of those cases? Maybe you can just give us an example of our, or how many, what percent he may have been involved in. Yeah, that, well, you know, most of his, most of his cases, especially the early cases were just simple debt collection type cases. I didn't make much money off them, like $5 a piece or something, if they paid, or they, you know, might pay in chickens or something, you know, it was always hard to get paid. Um, but later in the 1850s, especially, he did a lot of patent cases, a lot of technology related cases, some um, medical malpractice cases um, that were pretty interesting. Uh, there's, there's a couple of cases that I, I talk about several cases, but there, there's a couple of cases that really stand out and that probably most people have heard of. Uh, one is the Effie Afton case, which Bridge is- case. The, Right, the Affy Afton is a is a steamship, and that running up the Mississippi River north of St. Louis, or coming out of St. Louis north, and it runs into this brand new railroad bridge put up by the railroad, the first railroad bridge over the Mississippi River, and it goes over the the uh, Rock Island, which is between uh, between Illinois and and Iowa. Davenport, Iowa. And I, I was there a few years ago looking at the site. It's pretty cool, actually. And they have an old bridge that looks pretty much like it. Uh, but, you know, there was, so there was an accident and the, the Effie Afton caught fire, burned to the ground. Luckily, nobody was injured, but everything was damaged and was, we couldn't, couldn't float anymore, obviously. And the bridge was damaged and, and couldn't be used for a while. And then the, the steamship companies, with a lot of support from uh, St. Louis and some of the other places who depended on the steamships for transportation and commerce uh, sued the railroad company uh, and Lincoln worked for the railroad. So he, what he did was he went to that location. Uh, he hired an engineer to work with him. He had spent a lot of time on the waters, you know, with his own flatboat times and, and steamship pilot himself. So he he spent a lot of time looking at how the water flowed, what kind of eddies were created in the water, the, the speed of the boats, the, uh, the, 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 just the physics behind how a boat could hit one side of the pier and then bounce over and hit the other side of the pier without moving forward, which is basically impossible. And he, he'd spent a lot of time learning the science and the engineering behind this particular accident. And then he brought that to the case. And he has a, we, we have the summation that he gave uh, in pretty much uh, verbatim. And he goes, gets very, very technical explaining all of this. And then at the end, he turns that technical into language that people can understand. <laughs> and he convinces- This was a jury trial? Yeah, it was a jury trial. Convinces eight of the 12 jurors that it was really the steamship's fault, either by negligence or intentional because they would benefit from not having a railroad bridge across the river. Um, and so we, it, it ended up being a hung jury and then you know went on from there. But in the end, uh, it didn't matter because by that time, the railroad had rebuilt the bridge and was running trains already across the bridge again. But what it did, it showed Lincoln's science and technology background, but it also became the focal point for allowing the railroads to build bridges over the Mississippi. Railroads could go east to west and eventually, because of Lincoln signing the Pacific Railroad Act, go all the way to the west coast, east to west. All of the river traffic, the steamship traffic, basically funneled everything down the Mississippi River. So even the Ohio would hit the Mississippi, would all go down to New Orleans. And they would lose out a lot of business if you could start shipping things by train. Did, so they were not Lincoln, happy, and that was the main reason why they went there. But this really set things up for the railroad to be able to expand. Did Lincoln realize at the time that this was a Western expansion uh, problem that he was trying to help solve? He saw the expansion into the West and the bridges being of that import. Did he understand that? 
I think he did. Um, you know, I don't think I, I hadn't seen anything that said, well, I understand that this is this is a critical to the future of railroads or anything like that. But he was working for the railroad and he had worked for the railroad for quite a long time and was doing a lot of work for them. So he certainly was looking out for their interests. But he did understand how important railroads were. And he, he knew this in part because he had spent all those years in Illinois state legislator, legislature pushing internal improvements, which yeah. included navigable rivers, but also included uh, building railroads yeah. that he knew eventually would go, you know, all the way through all of the territory that was being acquired by the, uh, by the United States. Just so our viewers know, there's a wonderful discussion of another case that you're gonna to have to just buy the book and read it. There's so much in there. Uh, we can't go through everything here, yeah. but the Parker versus Hoyt water wheel patent case is a fascinating one as well. And that's mm -hmm. one, if you're interested in patent law, you'll be interested in reading that part of David's book. Um, this is kind of a, a brief aside in a way, but uh, one, he was interested in astronomy as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that, there's a very famous case, the, the murder case called the Almanac case. And those of us in the field of Lincolniana, <laughs> know this case very well and how he produced an almanac in the middle of the case to show that his client couldn't have murdered anyone or not really that but that no one could have seen him uh, murder anyone because there was no moon out there here's norman rockwell showing that case with a powerful looking up his length uh, in a white suit that lincoln bought for that trial i love that arm and the strength of his hand and forearm there but he used the almanac. Do you think his training, his, his education, his self-education in astronomy led him to think about the moon and how that might affect that trial? Or is that just speculation? No, I think he did. I mean, he, he long before this trial had uh, talked about um, astronomy. Uh, he had explained to some of the people back in Indiana that, you know, the moon doesn't rise. It's the, it's the way the earth moves. And, and he understood, you know, kind of rudimentary back then, his understanding of astronomy. But he was always fascinated by it. And he did see some comets. Um, he did also, uh, uh, later on, I mean, when he was in the White House, he would look through the telescope from his office. And he would go to the... Uh, what's now the Naval Observatory where the vice president's residence is. And he would look through the telescope that they had up at the stars. So he was always interested in astronomy. So when it came to this particular case, it all hinged on the idea that the witness was uh, said they were 150 feet away, quite a different, decent distance away, could see, oh, the moon was shining. It was full. It was right above everything that was happening at midnight. I could see everything. And, and Lincoln knew that that, he goes, that that doesn't sound right to me. And that's what the almanac, so he knew where to look in the almanac and see that the moon actually had set, that it was lower in the sky anyway. It wouldn't have provided enough light to, to support this guy's statement. And that was enough to uh, convince the jury that uh, uh, of reasonable doubt. And that he got the guy off, which, by the way, was the son of a, uh, friends of his from, from, from New, Salem. New Salem days. Yeah. So he had yeah. an incentive to try to get him off, but he did understand enough of the astronomy. I, I don't think he was, he didn't, he didn't become a really deep into it because he didn't have the time, but I think it was the impetus for Robert later on becoming also deeply into astronomy, even more so, and building, a, you know, an observatory up in Hildy. David, let's uh, now get into the Civil War years a bit. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to have you speak a little bit about one Joseph Henry, who was at the Smithsonian. And uh, he had many uh, discussions with Abraham Lincoln. The two of them spoke. Uh, and I was going to ask how frequently they did speak. It was interesting that Henry later wrote that he was impressed not only with a number of books Lincoln had read, but also that he, he remembers their content better than I do. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, 
part of this, of course, is that Lincoln had a very fine memory. But how frequently did they share ideas and, uh, and what was Joseph Henry's import to Lincoln? Well, we don't know exactly how many times they met. Um, and there's a bit of a difference, difference of opinion on, on that because uh, obviously there's not a whole lot of records. There are a few cases where Joseph Henry says in his diaries and his letters of which he was very prolific. Um, and I, and I, I worked with also uh, Mark Rothenberg who is, who is the, the head of the papers of Joseph Henry. Um, and he basically thinks that that Joseph Henry was an informal science advisor to Lincoln, that they did meet, uh, but that also Henry would meet with, uh, with the secretaries. So people like Stanton, the Secretary of War and Secretary of Navy Wills, um, and in, in even uh, Secretary of, uh, of State Seward, um, probably more often than he met with Lincoln. But there are other sources that, uh, talk about all sorts of meetings that the two of them had um, in which these other sources were, uh, were party to, um, either directly or secondarily. And it looks like, I think, that they probably sat down and had these just informal chats quite often. Um, and that Henry was uh, a, an informal science advisor for him. And he certainly was somebody that Lincoln called on for everything. Um, for those, for those who don't know Joseph Henry, he's the first secretary of the uh, Smithsonian Institution. Uh, it had been for 10 or so years before the Civil War started and throughout the Civil War and, and after. But Joseph Henry was also called upon by, by Lincoln to head the uh, permanent commission of the Navy, which was a board that was uh, basically three people headed by Henry to review all of these new inventions that would be coming through that Lincoln you know, only had so much time for. Um, Henry also was, that, was on the lighthouse board. He was a part of another group that was supposed to be putting together uh, uh, submissions to an exhibition, a scientific exhibition in, in London. Uh, he was just into everything, the National Academy, everything he was, he was involved in. Um, there are some really, and I, I, I'll let you read it in the, in the book, but there are some, there's some interesting stories about, uh, about Joseph Henry, who had been around for a long time before Lincoln. He was very close friends with Jefferson Davis, um, back, both when he was a senator from Mississippi and before that, when he was secretary of war uh, for uh, Pierce. Um, Jefferson Davis actually supported very much the, the Smithsonian and Henry. And Henry was, he was a unionist, but he was, he was also a little racist. You know, he, he wasn't, you know, so much into this whole idea of, of uh, ending slavery, but he wanted to save the union, so. You know, it's interesting uh, that you had mentioned in the book, uh, his association with Jefferson Davis, who became president of the Confederacy, but had been, uh, a Secretary of War under Pierce. I have a document signed by both of them right now, in fact, uh, for a Gettysburg hero, but later a Gettysburg hero. But it's interesting to me that this bumpkin from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln, understood the usage of the telegraph, whereas a past Secretary of War who became president of the Confederacy really didn't and didn't use it on a daily basis as the way Lincoln did, even sometimes in the middle of a battle, mm -hmm. be, being uh, on the telegraph to the front. Now, it could it be there were less resources in the South for tele telegraphy to be everywhere, but at the same time, it was, I thought it was interesting that Jeff Davis didn't use it, but Abraham Lincoln did. He understood yeah. the, new, the new invention. Right. Um, and there clearly were less resources in the South uh, at the beginning of the war. There were a lot more telegraph lines in the north than there were in the south. Same with trains, same with pretty manufacturing, pretty much everything. Um, but the south and Jefferson Davis just had a different way of looking at things. You know, they were still trying to trying to cobble together a bunch of states that didn't agree with each other all the time. Um, they weren't very well organized as a federal confederacy, um, whereas Lincoln who had used the telegraph 
for communication as a, as a lawyer in the past, um, he saw how that particular technology, telegraphs, were critical to winning the war. Uh, he had, he actually kind of nationalized the telegraph system, uh, which had all been private uh, up to that point. And same with the railroads, you know, he nationalized it and ran, made sure there were telegraph lines running into the war department because there hadn't been any before that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they had telegraph lines being run, you know, right out as close to the battle as they could get them. Uh, and putting up new lines all the time. There were thousands of miles of lines added during the course of the war. And as you said, he would, he would, he could, he could get telegraphs from the field um, and he could send telegraphs to the field. Now, up, up before that, uh, the, the commander in chief would basically tell his generals to the basic idea, this is what we want to accomplish. And the generals would run out and you'd never hear from them again until they find out two months after they died that they were, that they were dead <laughs> because there wasn't any way to communicate. Now he could get information, send information and be much more hands-on than previous presidents in, in any kind of communication. Now that had both a good side and a bad side depending on, on whether you thought he was micromanaging or and, and being, uh, being in the way or whether you thought that it was putting forth it. But the idea of using that technology to communicate was, was, was very much uh, something that Lincoln was into. You have an interesting story in here, which uh, again, I'll uh, have the viewers go to the book and read, we won't go over it now, how uh, Lincoln tied the idea of the telegraph to the use of an eye, of, their, of our eyes, and to read, and the connection of our eyes <clears throat> to reading and speaking. And he tied that to the telegraph and you give that anecdote in there. But uh, you know, you're not the first one, I guess, to tie Lincoln to technology and science. There are others who saw that earlier than us. Mm -hmm. For instance, Thomas Edison extolled Lincoln and his scientific technological prowess. And Neil deGrasse Tyson, who said that Quote, Lincoln was a science champion who set us on a course of scientifically enlightened governance. So uh, many people have, have seen that as well, although you have fleshed it out wonderfully in this book, David. There's so much in here uh, that explains not only Lincoln and, and his uh, relationship to science and technology, but what right. science and technology was at the time and it's readable for anyone to understand this. This is not such a scholarly or academic book, although it has both in it, that many, all our viewers could benefit from this. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, when he was in Washington, uh, besides the Smithsonian, what other places of science did Lincoln go to? Certainly he went to the armory and he used a, he tried the Spencer rifle and other mm -hmm. rifles right at the armory. And he also, of course, went to the Naval Observatory. Uh, there, he went to those places and others during his presidency? Yeah, he, I mean, there weren't very many places at that time. Um, there were people, but there weren't very many places. <clears throat> and and uh, one of the things that he did do was try to institutionalize that science into, the, into places that could sustain that beyond the war, not just the war, but beyond that, and are still there today. Um, and and uh, you know, I'll just give you a couple of examples. In his very first message to Congress, his annual message to Congress in December of 1861, so this is basically the State of the Union, um, he wrote that, uh, it says, right now there is only a bureau, there's like a desk in the Interior Department, the Home Department about, uh, that looks at agriculture. And at that's, this time, agriculture was still the main uh, area that people worked in. It was still mostly agricultural based, north in the north as well as the south. So he said, we should have something that it, at the very least can compile some statistics and can get information and send this out to farmers. So he suggested this 
in his first um, annual message to Congress. And Congress went through with it and the following spring, they passed a law creating the Department of Agriculture, which Lincoln duly signed and then duly reported, as you have suggested, I have created the Department of Agriculture, <laughs> you know, which they of course did because he said so. And the idea was there to have a more scientific based look at, um, at, at agriculture, which had been critical. And another chapter I talk about the, the science of slavery, one of the aspects of uh, why slavery grew in the United States involved uh, nutrient depletion in the soil. And it was a big problem. And so he wanted to have the federal government involved in studying this sort of thing and try out new seeds, try out new arrangements, plants, new fertilizers, new different things. And once you have that knowledge to transfer that knowledge back out to the people, out to the farmers. That system is still exists. We have uh, an agricultural extension uh, agency system that takes inf scientific information, the Department of Agriculture, and gets it back out to farmers. And vice versa, collects information from farmers and, and analyze it and disseminates it to other farmers. So he did that. Uh, he also uh, played a role uh, in the creation of the of the National Academy of Sciences, which still exists today. Uh, there's some debate on how much of a role he played. Um, I think he played more of a role than some people give him credit for, uh, in part because he was buddies with, uh, with Henry Wilson, a senator from my home state of Massachusetts, who he had worked with very closely on the DC Emancipation Bill and was very much involved in the creation of the National Academy of Sciences, and they used to talk all the time. So I think that uh, he had a little bit more than just he signed, signed it into existence, but he, he thought that this was a good idea to have an, a, a group that could deal with scientific issues during the Civil War and beyond, that still exists. And there, there were other aspects that he pushed into the federal government that, that are still uh, important today. And of course he had partners in Congress institutionalized technology and science right absolutely and also uh, uh, civilians as well who brought improvements to him uh, and I presume he helped bring to fruition many of those by sending them on to perhaps the permanent commission or elsewhere. Uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. Wilson was one of them was, but there are others in Congress who were very important to him in this in these endeavors in institutionalizing technology. Um, there were a few people here and there. There was a, a guy by the name of Connor Connis that um, was a senator, I think, from California, who uh, helped, um, who basically petitioned to set aside the uh, the Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Grove of big trees, um, set it aside to, for protection. And Lincoln had talked to him and he had talked to several people over the course of his presidency about going out to California. It was how important California was, its, its mining resources, its natural resources. And he wanted to go there after his finishing his second term. Um, so working with Connus and, and some other people, he, uh, he set it aside, and I may have the timing wrong here, but he, he set it aside and gave it to the state of California as a, a permanent, uh, to be permanently used as a park system for the use of, of Americans. Now it wasn't a national park, it became a state park initially. And it was only later, uh, 20 years later or so, when the park system had been created, national park system had been created, that it was turned back to the federal government and became a federal national park. Uh, in fact, it was the third national park in creation. Um, so he worked with people on that. Uh, one of the things though, uh, not so much with, with people in Congress, but um, other scientists. Uh, Joseph Henry was the, the most ubiquitous that was around, but there was also people like uh, Alexander Dallas Bach or Beach, depending on how you want to pronounce it, who was a great grandson of, of uh, Benjamin Franklin. He was the leader of a 
of an informal group called the Lazzaroni, uh, who were all these scientists uh, before the war that were trying to band together and push the idea of science because we didn't really have any good scientific organizations in the government at that time. Uh, we had the uh, 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 AAAS uh, that still exists today was, was existing, but basically they argued mostly with each other and then they fell apart during the civil war and, and never met during the whole civil war. So they weren't much use during the civil war. But he would, he would have uh, uh, Bach um, involved in all of these things. Like most of these that Joseph Henry was in, Bach was somehow involved too. He was the head of the Coast Survey and he created some maps that became very important for Lincoln's strategy uh, dealing with slavery as well at the beginning of the war. Um, there was a guy by the name of Charles Wilkes, who people might recognize the name from uh, the Trent Affair. Uh, he was the one running the, the uh, San Jacinto, I think, uh, the ship that uh, uh, got in the way and, and got the Trent, which was a British ship, that had Mason and Slidell on it and captured Mason and Slidell, these two envoys heading to the Europe and captured them, which seemed like a good idea at the time, but quickly became a problem. And they were a problem both because Lincoln didn't want to get into another war with, with, uh, with England, but they were also a scientific problem because while this was going on, Lincoln had a guy with the name of DuPont, of the DuPont chemical company family, who had a chemical company in at the time. And he was also, he was in England arranging to get saltpeter, uh, you know, niter, uh, which is potassium nitrate used in gunpowder. And that was put on hold by the British because uh, Wilkes had taken Mason and Slidell. So Lincoln had to deal with that both as a, as a foreign policy issue and as a scientific issue. And Wilkes, by the way, had been around, he had, 20 years before had led the uh, polar expedition, uh, scientific expedition. So there were a lot of scientists, and I talk about a few others in there as well that he, uh, that he worked with, people like Louis Agassiz and, and others. Uh, one, uh, one chapter we're not gonna be able to get into, our time is getting close, uh, was that Lincoln and slavery science. Uh, wonderful chapter. I think you say called science an instrument of emancipation. Say that again. Uh, it, that science was an instrument of emancipation. Oh, yeah, see he- In what manner was that? Yeah, it's because uh, there were a couple of things. Um, uh, science was used, uh, there, there are a couple of different ways to look at this. One is that science was used both to support the idea of slavery and to support the idea of anti-slavery. Um, and, and so I talk a little bit about both in, in each, but the, the scientific, uh, basically they were trying to show scientifically that white people were superior to black people. Um, and they, it was more pseudoscience than it was anything else. But this was something that uh, was used to, to support the idea of slavery. And it was very complicated. And I talk a lot about that in, in the book. But it was also used to support the opposite that, in fact, um, the, the races weren't really any different, that there is no such thing biologically as race, that difference in color is merely a difference in the historical location. You know, people that have gone many, 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 many generations living near the equator have more melanin in their skin to protect them from the sun, and people who live up in, in in uh, Sweden and points north, you know, don't need a whole lot because they don't get as much sun and it's more indirect. So there's a scientific aspect of that that was used to, to disprove this idea that science was trying to prove in, in slavery. So it became uh, kind of complicated. And Lincoln did get into the idea. He, did, he didn't get into it as deeply as some others because he's, he's a lawyer and he's a, and he's a politician. He's not a scientist. But he did read up on, um, on the issues. He did read something, a book called Vestiges of Man, which talks about essentially a rudimentary level of what Darwin talked about in Origin of Species. Uh, he did not, as far as I could tell, read Origin of Species, which came out just before he 
ran for president, um, uh, but William Herndon did. And William Herndon got a copy as soon as he could get one. Uh, and he said that Lincoln understood the principles of, of all of that and, and, and believed that uh, basically the idea of, uh, uh, of evolution, which eliminated some of the other issues, um, was right. So he did get into it. Um, and, and so it became, uh, anyway, I guess I, I'm kind of gone off the track here, but it, you know, I go into it much more eloquently in the book. <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, it's well, not that you're more eloquent, but broader. So it's, yes. it, there's a lot to learn there. I want to go back for just very briefly, we're getting over time now, uh, back to agriculture, because uh, I'm wondering, did he read much at the time when he was, uh, could he get books on agronomy when he was with his father on the farm? Or did it was practical knowledge from observation while working on the land that he really learned uh, agriculture? Yeah, he didn't read much in the way of agronomy books because in part there weren't very many and much in the way of agronomy books at the time. It was mostly practical. And you know, when you look at how Lincoln gained his knowledge, his education, you can really pigeonhole it into, I guess, three different pigeonholes. One is the formal education, these lab schools, the ABC schools. You would learn the basics, reading, writing, and arithmetic, you know. Then there was the self-study where he would get his own books and he would read this stuff and he would talk to people and he would, he would do debates in debating society in New Salem and he would do these Lyceum addresses where he would self-teach and learn from, from that. But there was also, the third would be experience. And mostly growing up on a farm, it was experience, especially even when he was a young kid in, 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 uh, in Kentucky, especially as he was growing up on the farm in Indiana, he was learning this stuff by um, seeing and observing and by having that knowledge transferred down to him from his father and from others of his father's generation who understood tree ecology, who understood hydrology, not in those terms. I mean, they didn't know it was tree ecology, forest ecology. They didn't know it was hydrology. They didn't know it was civil engineering, but they learned that trees are different. They're hardwoods and softwoods. There's, there's trees that are wetter. Some trees are wetter than other trees, which makes it very important for when which trees to use to build your, your cabin, because as they dry, they could split and break and, and leak, uh, which is not a good thing. Um, so most of that types of things, ecology type stuff, he learned the, and the agronomy, he learned through practical experience and learning from his, his father and other, other farmers. Well, I have a, a closing question, but before we get there, I just want to uh, remind our viewers that you're out, you <clears throat> are listening to our periodic program, A House Divided. We've been doing this since 2005. Our future, one of our future ones, it is future, it's October 24th, will be historian John Meacham, who has a, his latest book, And There Was Light, Abraham Lincoln and the American Struggle. It also will be a day of release, actually the day before release, but we'll allied those two days. So October 24th, 3.30 p.m. Central Time, if you subscribe to Abraham Lincoln Bookshop email list, you won't miss any of our future programs. Uh, with our numerous author interviews and signed books will be available, of course, for David Kent's book that we're with today, uh, Lincoln, The Fire of Genius, will have signed books available after this program is, uh, is aired. So a closing question, although I had many more, frankly, uh, this is such a rich book, David, uh, and it was so, there was so much to learn in here and fascinating and well-written too. But in regard to Lincoln's advice for America, you know, it sounds almost like Ben Franklin's, here's your democracy if you can keep it. Uh, but Lincoln in Congress in 1862 uh, said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves and then we shall save our country. So do you think 
Lincoln can help us in our nation's difficult times, even today. Certainly, certainly people like John Avalon and John Meacham seem to think so. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, I think it's pretty clear that people that know about Lincoln know, understand Lincoln better. Uh, they see parallels and they understand that Lincoln's view of, of, of the world and of the United States can teach us a lot of lessons about today, um, specifically about the, the science technology side. You know, we went through a period, we've, we've gone through recently a period where we just had this COVID epidemic, pandemic. You had people denying the science behind, you know, basic things like vaccinations, which, you know, was, a, was an issue back then when Lincoln was there. Uh, we have something like climate change, which is a science-based uh, issue that people just say, well, I don't want to have to deal with it, so I'm just going to make believe the science doesn't exist. So we have a certain amount of denial of science, and there was then as well, um, but, you know, we, we see it, and it's really the same groups of people generally that uh, fall into both sides, whether you believe in science or don't, or, or reject science. It's, it's about the same now as it was then, um, if you want to generalize a little bit. But he showed that science, technology, and education were critical to how we develop as a country, were critical to uh, how we solve our problems, and critical to how we make this a democracy for all Americans, not just a small number of uh, uh, connected wealthy Americans that sometimes uh, it seems like it. Uh, so I think we can, we can learn from that. There's a lot of science that's going on now and technology that's going on now. There are a lot of challenges it, and, he, and Lincoln understood this, that science and technology all, didn't always give you the best path forward. <laughs> Uh, some of these weapons of mass destruction, as they were defined by the Civil War era, uh, you know, he rejected. He, he said, we're not going to use poisonings. We're not going to use these uh, uh, incendiary devices that would just incinerate people. We, we're not going to do that. Uh, so he did make these moral judgments, ethical judgments back then that we still have to make today. But other than, you know, besides that, you know, he did understand that it, it is important to to the way uh, we develop things today. And I, I just want to quickly reiterate, this is not a science book and it's not a, uh, a, an academic only book. It's a, it's a book that talks about science and history and Lincoln in a way that people can understand. You know, I didn't want to write a book that only four people could read. That's, that wasn't going to be useful. So, so this is very uh, easy to read and and, and yet, I think there's a lot of information in there. Fascinating information. Lincoln and the fire of genius, how Abraham Lincoln's commitment to science and technology helped modernize America. It's, it's a unique book. And I think one that everyone's going to like. You can still get signed book plates that we will give with our first editions, hopefully, if you get it soon enough. So David Kent. Thank you so much for joining us on A House Divided here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me.